making your value proposition sales ready. Um, for those of you that know me, you know how passionate I am about this topic. Um, it definitely is something that um, I spend a lot of time thinking about. I work with a lot of individuals and a lot of companies on it. And so I want to share with you uh, some ideas to make this really valuable for you. So here's what we're going to do. Um, topics I want to do is I want to sort of give you a context for the value prop. I also want to talk about the top weaknesses um, that we need to be addressed, how to translate buyer needs in a way that will be helpful um, for us to really get this to be sales uh, driven kinds of messaging. I'm actually gonna walk you through a, um, I'm gonna actually walk you through a very specific example. It's actually um, a customer that I worked with. Uh, he will, they will be nameless. Um, they've since, since been um, acquired, um, but I'll give you some real ideas. Um, then we're gonna break down the pieces, right? Particularly around drafting buyer objectives, how to craft a real offer statement that can be used both in marketing and sales uh, activities, the differentiator, which is the hardest part of it all, and then how to make the whole thing bulletproof. So here we go. Let me just start by kind of leveling the field. Not, much, not many of us get training on uh, how to develop a good value proposition, and that can be really difficult. So there's lots of definitions. Um, this is the one that I happen to like the best, well, of the standard definitions. I, I, I of course, redid it because that's me. Um, but here it is. Uh, a clear and succinct statement indicating the specific value, that's my emphasis, of a service or a product or an offer to a specific audience, saying that word twice is really important, in order to differentiate its value. And I think the differentiator has to be really tied into that specific audience and that specific value. That's all really, really important. And so we want to make sure that we, uh, that we get that. Um, here's, here's my definition. I want to just kind of enlighten you a little bit about how there's another way to think about this. My definition is a value prop is a buyer-focused description of value that demonstrates your knowledge about the buyer's experience or challenge and your specific offer to address it, underscored by what differentiates your offer from any other. Here's what's different about this. First of all, we're starting with the buyer. We're not starting with our own offer, our own, our own company, our own products, our own services. But really what the value prop is supposed to do is to demonstrate your, value, your knowledge about the buyer, not the knowledge about your own stuff. And this is where a lot of value props kind of veer off the road. A really good value prop shows the buyer you know a lot about them. You get what they care about. That's really important. Um, and so you want to go through with that and, and really tie your offer and your differentiator there. And so what I'm going to work through with you this morning is how do I get here? Because I would say 80 to 85 percent of value propositions are all uh, buyer, uh, excuse me, all product or service focused. And, and the buyer has to figure out whether this is meaningful to them or not on their own. And really good sales-enabled value prop makes it easier for them to figure that out. So here's how I want you to think about it. I literally want you to think about your value proposition as if it were a mirror, literally, right? So your buyer comes along, and there's your value prop. There's the mirror of your value prop. Um, who should the buyer see when they look in that mirror? I can tell you who they shouldn't see. Shouldn't be you. If the value proposition mirror reflects your company, your product, your service, your everything, it's not as engaging to the buyer. They'd much rather see their own face. And so that's how I want you to think about that value prop. Okay? Those companies who can reflect the buyer in the mirror of their value prop, are getting to get buyers to take one step forward to start with. And that's really, really what we're looking to do here, right? So what does it mean? It means that you have to redefine what value means in your value prop. you got to really, really look hard at the markets that you're in and the buyers you're trying to attract and define value according to them, okay? We have a lot of opinions about what we think is valuable about our product or service offerings. 
it's really, really interesting when you talk direct to buyers to see what's actually relevant to them. So that's the mindset we want to have. And relevance is really what a value proposition needs to be about, right? Right now, uh, and I did a lot of surveying, and I'm going to share some survey information, some survey data with you. Um, I surveyed um, buyers in, in uh, technology buyers um, on what about value propositions impact their, their buying decisions. What they see is a broad range of relevance, okay, all over the map. Their feedback was that most of what of the value props they look at are much too product or service focused. And so what it leaves buyers to have to connect the dots, does my need, my challenge, my goal, and my objective fit this offering? They just figure it out by themselves, right? So the key thing that we learned is, in the research is that aligning with the buyer um, and their needs directly in impacts your success rate. According to the survey, if you're not relevant, there's a 35% decrease for your likelihood to get on their short list and a 47% decrease for actually uh, being selected and purchased. That's a really big, um, that's a really big decrease, right? So the more relevant you are, that improves those odds. The less relevant you are, that's what you're going to be faced with. You, you've got a close to a 50-50 shot whether you're going to get purchased or not. We need to address that, right? So here's what, the, what, the, uh, what my survey respondents told me is the key relevance issues that they have. There's really no information built into the value props we look at about buyer issues and needs. It's simply not there. There's very little around specifics on the actual value delivered. A lot of organizations are afraid to attach real numbers because they don't want to be held to it. I've had those conversations as a product marketer, believe me. Um, they complain that there's generic language that's applicable to everyone and anyone. So it's really hard to figure out, depending on what my role in the organization is, how does this impact my role in the buying decision and what I think is important and what needs I have. Um, often we find features that are actually disguised as benefits. They're not true benefits, they're really, they're really features, right? If I had a nickel for every feature and benefit discussion war I've had in my uh, days as a product marketer, I could retire now, right? What they really tell us is your value props are internally focused and they're very company centric. And then you get to the differentiators and you can't prove them or there's no proof offered or they're not really meaningful to us. Um, so we'll talk more about differentiators because that I think is the hardest part for sure. So let's talk a little bit about uh, you know, what a real value prop needs to look like. Here's the thing. Most people think of a value prop and they think of these two things. It's a tagline or it's an elevator pitch, right? Let's just pull together a quick, you know, let's pull together our value prop and they go straight to the elevator pitch. Particularly salespeople want that, but we also in marketing, you know, tend to think about it's this one short pithy statement. Well, actually, that's really at the bottom of the stream of things we need to do to get there. We, we, we often will also kind of have an offer statement, right, about the, about the product. But this whole bunch of the things we need to really nail down. Who are the key sectors, industries, and segments, and who are the key targets in there, right? What are the buyer issues, goals, and, and opportunities that they're trying to pursue? We really ought to have a buyer objective statement that nets that stuff out. Um, we really need to nail down our differentiators. And by the way, less is more. And oftentimes we have too many of them and they're very generic and not provable and all of our competitors are saying them. And then we really need to nail it. And this is the part that's always missing. And I'm going to share with you how to do value drivers, quantification, and proof that in a sales situation are key. So here we go. We're trying to go to an elevator pitch type thing or a tagline type thing because that's the way a lot of people think about value props. And honestly, we need all this other stuff to get to those two things, to make them really good and, and on point and, and relevant to the buyer. So what I do is, I, and I recommend this to you, is, um, is building a value proposition platform. It's not just a statement. So really what you want to break it down into is three key pieces. The buyer objective statement, a specific offer statement that actually relates directly to the buyer objective, the, the, the totally relevant, quantifiable, provable differentiators, 
And if you have one or two that meet the, that criteria, you're ahead of the game. And then you back it up with what I call value drivers. I'll share more with you about that in a moment. Quantification for each one of those value drivers and then, the, and then proof to back it up. In a sales situation, if I have all of that, I am seriously in a good position to have a really um, focused, relevant conversation with my target. So let me start, and I'm going to go right into some real examples. Let me start with a company that I worked with, um, and I'm going to use them as my example. Okay? They were literally a 10-year-old quote-unquote startup in the software industry, and they still were a startup because they, they really hadn't done or made major growth. They've been pretty flat. When I got to them, they had been flat for probably three or four years, but they still hadn't kind of broken through. Their offering was a software platform, and what it, in, in a nutshell, um, they had this really um, proprietary um, software platform that was, that was a search engine that was able to pull in both traditional um, media and then user-generated media through things like, you know, Twitter and you know, all of the social media outlets that are out there, and then to be able to sift through that and pull out things that were said that are relevant about your brand, right? Um, and, and here's the, the real challenge. They're marketing a technology to a non-technical audience. They were marketing to marketing departments in um, upper mid-market and, and uh, enterprise companies, and then also to big advertising agencies who were servicing, you know, big brands all over the world. So Technology product, non-technical audience, and you guessed it, all they kept talking about was the software. All they kept talking about was the features of the software. And that was really, really challenging um, overall um, for them. And, and it was hard to connect. It was a hard sell. At the time that this, I worked with this, um, social media was still new, but it was getting hot, and people were trying to get their arms around, how do I actually figure out and get my arms around everything that's being said about our company, our brand, our products? Um, oh, and they didn't really have a marketing department. It was mostly just salespeople. So right out of the gate, they kept changing up on the fly, salesperson by salesperson, their message because they were trying to find something that stuck. If any of that sounds familiar, you'll find this really helpful. The interesting thing is, no matter the size of the company that I work with, and I work mid-market and enterprise, I've even done some small business ones of these, but mostly larger organizations, 100 million and up, and um, those challenges are the same no matter the size of the company, which I think is really interesting. Okay, so here's the deal. You really need to do some homework first. And, and so what I really advocate is doing some customer interviews. And I would suggest you, do, you have a third party do those so that they will actually tell you the truth. What are the things they're really trying to solve? What are their biggest challenges? This is not interviews about your company. This is interviews about the objective or challenge or whatever that your offering is trying to address. You want to get at what are they really thinking? What are they really trying to do? What's most important to them? What are those stumbling blocks, right? To really get buyer point of view language around the challenge or objective or problem that your organization and your product or service are trying to solve, right? That's the first part. That's really going to be very important. And you'll see why in a little bit. I also think you ought to do a competitive messaging review. And what that is, is to line up five or six of your top competitors, whether it's across the organization or for a specific offering, and then really look at the components of messaging. What does the value prop say? What is their, what is their tagline? What are the keywords that they use? What's their positioning say? How do their offers line up against yours? language pulled from their testimonials and lay them side by side to see what's being said, what's, what's being repeated. So I want to know all the things that we're all saying, right? Because that's not very differentiating, right? I also want to look at what differentiators they put there. But I want to look at what are we repeating, all of us going after the same customers? Um, where are there gaps or opportunities that we might be able to, fi to fill messaging-wise? Where are there opportunities for us to really drive some relevant value? Very, very important. And those two things help you decide, okay, based on what I've learned, I can potentially 
do a value prop and messaging in this direction, or I could go in this direction or that direction, because those all are opportunities that the bulk of our competitors are not going after. And comparing it to my customer interviews, yep, those are relevant to what, what our targets are talking about and thinking about and, and trying to understand, okay? Without this homework, you're looking at the world from inside your company out, and you're guessing. And I was a product manager for eight years. Can I just tell you? I wrote some of the worst value propositions back in the day, and that was over 20 years ago. And I was doing it from an inside-out point of view, from my product, what I believe they should care about. Going outside and getting that outside view is really key. So if you do that homework, that allows you to pivot um, from the value of your offering, from, out, from your company and your own point of view, to the value that the buyers seek. The homework is all about that pivot, right? So now we can start to build a value prop that's relevant to a specific need, that we can, um, that has a real impact on their organization. We can get at really tangible business benefits, tangible that they're front of mind for them, not all the different things that we think they could be, and not features disguised as benefits. You might also want to even address potential risk or reward because risks and rewards are in their mind as they're making these purchase decisions. How do I quantify the offering? How do I help them make business justification to get the funding? Differentiation that, that's truly differentiating. I did a review, a competitive review, and I uh, uh, the, the case study example that I'm, gonna, that I'm gonna work with with you, they had nine competitors. And I compared the differentiators across the board. And seven of the companies, including my client, had all the same differentiators. Not very differentiating. Why are liar pants on fire? That's not unique, right? So that's a really important piece of it. And then to get objective third-party proof to back up that differentiator. And I'm going to show you how. So that's the pivot, okay? So let's just start, right? I'm going to dive right in. This is a form that I use. This is my uh, value proposition platform document. And where we start is really nailing down the sector, the primary industry, and the segments I'm going after, okay? Let me just say this right now. A one-size-fits-all value proposition fits no one. I have a closet full of clothes that say one-size-fits-all. Let me just tell you how often I wear them, right? So we want to make sure that we get super, super specific about where we're going, down to the target level. Who are the decision makers that I'm trying to go after, and who are the key influencers? It's really, really important, okay? And so we nail those down. And this, is, uh, this example is this uh, particular client of mine that I, that I work with. So this is my case study example. What we did is we nailed down the key issues that, the, that these particular people were having, okay? And so this particular uh, value prop is aimed at the marketing uh, departments of the mid-market and enterprise companies they were going after, okay? They also were looking at advertising agencies. We did a separate value proposition platform document for them. So we're looking at CMOs and VPs, right? Marketing, product marketing, analyst relations, and then same in terms of the managers, right? So what were some of their issues? Well, one of them was we're having a really hard time tracking all the messages that are out there in social media, all the different sources, all the different voices. We, we can't even tell how our own messaging is being perceived, right? The content that, about our brand that's being created by people outside of our company, we need to know what they're saying. and It's hard to find all of it or even to sift it out, which is actually relevant. How do we track all the blogs that are out there in the Twitter feeds to figure out how many mentions we're getting, right? We don't have a real good way to actually collect all that. It's pretty laborious. It's really manual, right? Multiple systems, individual research. We're doing everything on spreadsheets, okay? And then social media metrics. It's better now than when I did this project um, a few years back. But what metrics should we even be looking at, right? Um, how do we really, really get our arms around how the, our brand is being perceived um, when, when the social media world is creating all this content about us that we have no control over? Those are really core business issues that these marketing departments were having around their particular brands. So what we did is we took those issues um, and we got that from our buyer research and then determining a messaging direction based on our competitive uh, messaging review. And we came up with a buyer objective statement. 
Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, this took a while to get to this, um, but um, lots of discussions, lots of drafts, but this is where we started. Um, tuning into the, oops, so let's go back. Um, excuse me, I went ahead of myself. So here's the buyer objective. Um, tuning into the voice of your market is becoming more difficult due to the millions of consumer to consumer conversations that are diluting the impact of your company's marketing program. In today's Influence 2.0 world, consumers are creating their own brand dialogue by blending your product messaging with their own experiences and opinions, other consumers' input, and traditional media content. Can you afford to be out of sync with your market? That's where we started. Um, and so uh, that became the basis for our value proposition, right? And if you go back to the research that I shared with you, one of the complaints that buyers have, particularly with technology, is that there's no information on or no uh, inclusion of our needs or issues in the value props that we look for. This is how you actually get it in, right? You build it right into your value prop. It's the first section. We vetted this um, internally. We vetted this with some trusted customers to make sure that the objective really matched up to the research that we'd done and to um, the buyer issues that we had extracted from our review and from whatever. So we did some vetting there and, and netted it out to this. We probably went through seven or eight versions of this to get it to where it is. And if, uh, the Influence 2.0 became pretty uh, big for us um, and no one was saying it at the time that we did that. So um, then we moved into the company offer, right? And, and everyone wants to jump here first. Um, but what we did is we waited, we pushed back, and we also got rid of everything we were saying before. So XYZ Corp, a market influence analytics company, sifts and interprets the millions of voices at the intersection of consumer-generated and traditional media. Our award-winning platform, uh, which, is, which is called Orchestra at the time, been renamed, integrates innovative technology with expert analysis to identify the people, issues, and trends impacting your business at the speed of the market. Here's what's different about this, okay? I didn't say anything that was um, specific about the technology, right? Uh, I didn't get into the bits and bytes. Their old offer statement had all kinds of technical stuff in it. And we also weren't really like other organizations. So we, weren't, we didn't have a category, right, of, of what we were. Excuse me, I'm saying we, because I get very involved when I do this value prop stuff, right? Um, so. We, we had to really name ourselves, like what it kind of, what are we? Well, we're a market influence analytics company. That wasn't, there was, that was not a category at the time. Um, and so we needed to name it because it was hard to explain and everybody was explaining it different. Every salesperson was explaining it different, okay? You'll also notice this statement ties right back in to the buyer objective, right? It plugs right into that issue, okay? Here's your issue. Here's how we solve it, right? And to really think about, again, this is being aimed at marketing people, right? So I, they think about people and issues and trends that impact the business. They are having to keep up with the speed of the market with their own messages about their offerings, right? So we're talking about this in their language. Um, um, and, um, that's really, really important, okay? We went through multiple iterations of this. This actually spiked some really interesting conversations at the company about, okay, what are we really? Very interesting, and a lot of technology companies kind of get their arms into the same issue, which is we get so wrapped around our um, technology that we don't always necessarily, if we're not in an already established category, get re are really clear about who are we really? What kind of a company are we really, right? So somebody says, you know, what does your company do? Or what is your company about? You get like 10 different answers. Right now, if you went to your organization and asked 10 people what your company really is, I bet you you'd get a lot of different answers. I, bet, I guess I bet it'd be a lot about the product, which I think is kind of fascinating. So now that we've got this second piece, right, really, really key, and while you're doing this kind of work, you're going to keep trying to jump into that company offer, right? Um, everybody wants to go there. 
And um, you got to stop. You got to stop and say, wait a minute, we should be talking about the buyer. You'll notice in the buyer objective statement, we don't mention the company at all, and nor should we, right? It absolutely does not have a place in your buyer objective statement. And you're going to find yourself when you start drafting it, you keep creeping in there. And when we went through the different iterations, that, we kept having to push it out and push it out. Like, wait, we're not ready yet. We're not supposed to be talking about us. This is entirely from the buyer's perspective. You're only allowed to add, talk about yourself in the company offer piece of your value prop. And again, it's in relation to the buyer's objective. So it's not an opportunity for you to go, oh, let me tell you everything about myself. Let me tell you everything we know about our product. Because honestly, you don't want to do that. Less is more. What's relevant to the buyer objectives and only. And remember, you don't have to stuff everything in here. And one of the reasons why a lot of value props are very, very generic is that we try to stuff everything in because we don't want to miss anything. A value prop is the beginning of a conversation. It's the attraction piece of it. It is, how do I get someone to look at me twice, right? Or to, or to, or to take a step forward and say, tell me more. You're going to have plenty of opportunity over the course of the marketing and sales cycle and the buyer journey to have those conversations. But the reality is what you really want to do is you want to be sure that, um, that this is really very, very focused on the buyer. Okay, now I'm going to move into the differentiator piece. And that piece was really hard, okay? Um, because we really were trying to nail down something that was actually different. As I said to you, seven of the nine competitors, including my client, were all talking about the same thing. They absolutely were all talking about the same thing. And um, uh, that is really difficult. So right now, what we nailed down to is they had a, a, a technology nugget that would be really important um, as a differentiator. So this is what we came up with. XYZ Corporation pioneered, that was a very key word, a proprietary content analysis engine to extract meaning from high volumes and diverse sources of text. A technology used by U.S. intelligence agencies for over eight years. Ooh, there's the credibility punch right there. We are an innovator in the integration of consumer-generated media and mainstream media offering access to the greatest breadth of content sources and analytical expertise available in the market. That was true. They were the only ones who'd actually built the platform for this. The problem was all they kept doing was talking about the technology from a technology standpoint and everybody was missing the real, the real impact of what that could have. So in the differentiator, we needed to say, hey, wait a minute, we're the only ones that do this. And at, and, and at the time they were, right? We pioneered this. It's proprietary, right? Um, hard to figure out what to call it. We ended up, and, and we wanted to do it in plain English. So getting to content analysis engine was not easy, right? We, we, we went through a lot of different ways to describe that because our audience are marketers, right? And so we didn't want to get into the bits of advice because quite frankly, that's a turn off, right? We used that technology. We started this, this, this the, the genesis of this product was, uh, an engine used by U.S. intelligence agency, th my client built that for them and then saw that it was a commercial, had a commercial application in other areas, and that's how they launched this whole thing. We are an innovator in the integration of these uh, media and mainstream media, and that's really important. So, um, very, okay. So, we've got our three chunks here. Um, oh, my, this is not a tight three-word kind of of thing. And um, you're right, it's not. It is a, um, it's, it's a little wordier than most people actually um, think because they're thinking tagline, they're thinking elevator speech. You can pull those out of this, but what you really need is a strong platform that really outlines the key pieces of your value proposition. So that's why this is nice and meaty because from this, I can jump to, to messaging, both content messaging and sales messaging much more easily than I can if I've just got a, 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 you know, a one sentence or a two sentence value proposition. Um, most organizations, their value prop is just the center part here, the company offer. And it should be so much more than that. It needs to have all of these pieces. So here's the key piece. 
we're not done yet. We need to be able to back it up because that's where the rubber hits the road and that's where you make it sales ready. So we need to collect supporting materials and package them with the value prop platform so that, that we can get the marketing content um, and build it out much more easily and consistently and we can help build a series of sales conversations, right? Too often we've got a three sentence statement and then we're making everything up from scratch and that's where your messaging starts to go all over the map and sales start saying whatever they need to say to get, get interest or they keep like throwing a different version or making up new versions because they're just trying to get some engagement from the buyers they're going after. Um, so the first part is to back it up is you need to nail down what I call buyer value drivers. And a value driver is kind of the top of mind key points of value that are in their head as they're starting a buyer journey and as they're starting to figure out what it is they need, who they're going to talk to, who's on the short list and who they're going to purchase from. These are value points that are important to their decision. And so they typically fall into several of these buckets, right? Ease of use is a good one, increased revenue, uh, reduced customer churn, increased market share. I mean, these are kind of the basics, right, of the kind of value drivers that are, are top of mind. The key to it is you have to actually spell it out, right? It could be other things besides this, but these tend to be kind of the, the, the kind of standard. I tend to go here first and go, okay, does any of this in, you know, does any of this register for the buyers that I'm specifically going after, right? Or are there more other things that are happening? That's really important, okay? So the second half of my value prop platform is this piece. Nailing down the value drivers, we're going to quantify each one of them, we're going to offer proof for each one of them. So the value drivers that we netted out, we had, God, we had probably, I think we had probably like 15 of them when we started. For this particular uh, offering, this value prop and these buyers in the target uh, segment market that we were in, the things that the, the, these marketers, the CMO, the VPs of marketing and, 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 um, and uh, analyst relations, immediacy. The data's got to be up to date. I want immediate information, right? I want to be able to see it as the content is generated out there in social media. I want to be able to pull in kind of the, 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 the traditional media stuff, but all the stuff that's being generated out there by users, I want to pull it in immediately. I want to be able to measure it. I want to be able to look at not only just a number of mentions I get, but by a, a host of other metrics as well. So the measurement of all of this is really important. And oh, by the way, there's so much crap out there that's in, in social media. I don't want this, I want a, a tool that's going to pull in only the stuff that's relevant to my brand. That's a tall order of those value drivers, right? Because you don't want them to have to sift through and, you know, you get a report from the, from the software and it has, you know, a bunch of mentions that have nothing to do with your organization or your product or your offering. So that relevance piece was really, really high. So we netted out, we probably started with 10, we netted it out to these three. The next thing we did, we said, okay, how do I, how do I quantify it so that I, that value driver is really real, right? And so there's lots of ways to do it. Data from customer results, like, you know, revenue numbers or percentages. Statistics from a recognized industry expert is another good way to quantify a particular value driver. Are there any survey or research results from an industry relevant source? Or did you do a formal survey and, um, and actually publish it and then you could use your own survey results, right? Um, did you get any industry or expertise awards about your offering? Those are really good credibility builders because they're coming from a third party. Are there documented improvements or reductions like increases in profit or reductions in cost that you can actually state, whether that's with case studies uh, for clients who are willing to step up or that, you're, that you can stick a stake in the ground and say, customers like ours have seen increases of, you know, this range or cost reductions in that range. It's got to be able to actually put some numbers to it. Otherwise, it's just marketing fluff and your buyers won't believe it. And that's the truth, right? So you want to quantify it. So here's what we did, okay? We were like this 10-year-old startup. Um, people didn't really know a lot about because we just, our, our audience just wasn't getting what we were saying and we weren't backing it up well. So on the immediacy thing, we actually, they actually won an award from the Massachusetts Innovation Technology Change, uh, Exchange for best use of technology and applied to 
technology for delivering immediate market intelligence. How great is that, right? They had a, an award that gave them kudos for that. Totally quantified the need for that immediacy because it was literally a category in this particular um, award. So that was cool. Measurement. They also happened to get an award for best new measurement technology from the measurement standard. Bang, we nailed it, right? And then the relevance piece, right? Um, and this was a quote that we got uh, from Jupiter Research that really backed up the need for relevance, right? And particularly, 66% uh, of surveyed companies were operating under the assumption that the effect of consumer-generated content on brands would greatly increase over the next 12 months. So that relevance had a lot of um, urgency to it, and we were able to back it up with a, uh, a research study um, outside, third party. So that was key. Now we're going to go one step further. And this is where a salesperson will literally love you for the rest of your life if you can give them proof. Quotes from experts, client testimonials, partner testimonials could, could suffice, outside research study. Go to your market analysts, right? If you're in a, in a, in a market where there are analysts out there, third party analysts that comment on your industry, um, if there are quotes or reports where, that you are either part of or that you can cite as backup um, for your value driver, oh, that's great. Real case studies, right? Real case studies with some meat behind them and some specifics. Factoids that back you up from key industry sources. Lots of opportunity here. Whether you're trying to do a value prop for a brand new product or service offering, or you've got one that's more established, you've got one that you're repositioning, Whatever stage of the life cycle of that offering, you can bring proof here. Even if you don't have client testimonials yet, you can still have proof that's real and that's objective and third party from some of these other sources. So it gives you a lot of leeway. So what we did in, in this particular example is we actually had um, two customer um, quotes that we could use, and then we also had an industry um, expert organization, uh, association, came world. Um, so we had three quotes that we got permission to use. And so right out of the gate, from a sales perspective, I now have the value prop. I can speak directly to the buyer issues, and I can also back it up with some quantification and some proof. And, and in terms of messaging, I have three core messaging things. The immediacy of the data, measurement of the data, relevance of the data, because I know that buying audience, it's, that's what they really care about. That's what they're thinking about as they're making a decision. All right, so now I have a direction for my marketing content, and I also have a direction for my sales conversation. I mean, you just can't ask for more than that, right? So we ended up netting it out. Now we can go to the tagline, and now we can go to the elevator pitch. In today's Influence 2.0 world, can you afford to be out of sync with your market? That was their initial message, and that was for a while, excuse me. And, um, and then we basically took the offer statement, and I just saw a typo. God, that drives me crazy. Spell check is useless. Anyway, um, then we took that offer statement, and we really kind of just netted it out into an elevator pitch. Um, some people would say it could be a little bit shorter. Here's what I'm going to say about an elevator pitch. I'm not a big fan of them, to be quite honest. I want to have a conversation. I don't want to have an elevator pitch. But an elevator pitch that has enough meat and enough specificity that actually I might be interested in having a conversation with you, I think is more important. And so that's what we did here. And so then now with all of these pieces, we have the value proposition platform in a box. And we rolled it out to the entire company. We literally had a, a company meeting and we sat down, sales is in the room, marketing's in the room, operations in the room, product development's in the room the technology departments in the room, and we rolled it out to all of them. And we let them ask questions. And we showed how we were going to use it. We had a map that showed how we we're going to use it. I can't share that stuff with you. Um, and some of that was fairly proprietary. I mean, even this um, is a little bit, but I kind of took uh, the names off of it. And here's the, the good news to the story. They've been kind of, you know, 10 years plodding along. And within um, two to a half years, uh, after we did this and launched it, and we actually launched it, you know, in our, we redid the website, we relaunched all of our materials, we really started getting the salespeople doing this conversation. They got noticed by a much larger company um, uh, in, um, who was a little bit outside of their particular area, who wanted to add this in. It was a kind of a, a media company, and they got bought. 
and which was an awesome thing for the founding team, let me tell you. And one of the pieces of feedback they got was, one of the things that drew us to you is that value proposition, because that spoke directly to a hole in our offering. Bang, right? Everybody went home. Everybody went home with a lot of money in the bank. Beautiful thing. Um, so anyway, lots of different outcomes, right? It could drive more business, which it did. It can get them closer to their customers, which it did. It also provided a buyer for them, which they didn't even know they were looking for. So that was a, a really good piece of it. So here's the deal. To me, for me to net it out, you want to get to the point, okay? And here's what I would like you to think about. Instead of uh, organizing your messaging, your content, right, by product, or by service offering. Think about organizing them by the challenges that you're trying to address, your buyer challenges that you're trying to address. Here's our content for this issue. Here's our content for that issue. Here's our content for this goal, all buyer driven, okay? And then break it up by industry or key market segment, right? I think that that's an easier way to go about delivering messaging from a marketing and from a sales standpoint to live prospects, rather than having to kind of figure out, well, I gotta pull this and this and this. Do it by buyer, need or challenge. Best way, what I'm suggesting is, attach your offerings to the challenges, not the reverse. Let me say that again. Lead with your challenges and attach your offerings there, as opposed to, here's our product, here's our service, and why, here's all the stuff that comes with it, here's all the challenges and issues. Flip it around, pivot, that's the key thing. Then what you can do is really put together a messaging playbook, and this is something I, I build for customers. Here's all the value props. And did I say earlier, one size fits all fits no one? Absolutely true. So you may do versions of this. If you've got the core value prop platform built, then it's very easy to version it by industry, right? Um, or uh, really you know, key target titles and roles. You might wanna tweak it a little bit if you have a couple of people on the decision-making team that are so different. You could do a version for the CFO because you're gonna to have to have that conversation as a salesperson. So I can take that and now pivot and do versions of it. My taglines and pitches, I could put in this uh, messaging document really targeted discovery questions for the sales team based off of th th this value prop platform. Objection responses, I could build that too. Scripts if I've got an inside sales team, right? And then what other testimonials, case studies, research, um, what kind of content assets do I have by buyer journey stage? You know, hey, salespeople, here's the relevant content for the awareness stage. Um, just want you to be clear of it as in your prospecting, you're going to need to pull from that bucket. Here's when they're doing the short list. Here's the content that's relevant there. So that everything that you need is in this playbook, whether it's a sales conversation, a marketing conversation, content development, makes it very easy and consistent so that you're not starting with a blank page every time you have to do it. And so this is a, a visual I created um, for a particular client that I've been using with a lot of them now is, okay, how do I take that platform and infuse it in my content, right? Well, the kinds of sales collateral things that I might wanna put together. What do I need for public relations? What do I need for analyst relations if I'm, if I'm dealing with analysts, right? Websites, videos, blogs, town halls, however you're doing it, that's really, really key, right? Once you've got it, then you start have, you have to start using it. So that's what I have for you today. I also, sort of a shameless plug, because I'm so crazy about value props, and I've been doing this for 15 years, I have a book coming out in January, Value Propositions That Sell, Turning Your Message Into a Magnet That Attracts Buyers. It's gonna have a lot of really full-blown information, templates, tools, more customer stories. I think you'll find it really interesting, and, and I will definitely share more of that with you then, for sure. Um, I've done this kind of work, um, for a number of organizations, in addition to all of the other marketing and sales related um, consulting I've been doing out there for 20 years. Um, companies large and small, SMB, mid-market and enterprise. Um, so uh, lots of industries, not just technology as well. Um, so there's lots of ways um, to go about this value proposition to new messaging piece. A uh, couple of things. Um, if you have any questions, drop them in your chat box. I have a few more minutes I can, I, I can um, I can uh, share with you. Um, I'm just taking a look at what I have right now. Um, I am going to um, give you access to the recorded version of this uh, uh, webinar. I will also give you access to a PDF of these slides as well. Um, I'm also, and I will get that stuff out to you uh, probably tomorrow afternoon, if not Friday morning at the latest. 
Um, I'm also going to um, give you an offering um, that you might want to consider. I have an online program, uh, value proposition development program, do it yourself on demand, called the Simple Value Proposition Plan. And I'm going to give you a special offer uh, to, uh, in my uh, next email to you um, on that, um, that course, because I think it could be really, really helpful for those of you who really want to do this yourself. Um, sometimes the value props are a little more um, complicated or multi-level. So we're also going to offer a special offer for coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching myself, uh, doing a one-on-one -on -one coaching of you through your online program. Every time you have to do a worksheet, we set up a time and talk it through, and I can help you tone it, make it tighter. I also have another coach who's working with me. Her name is Liz Hyman. She's been in the marketing and sales industry for um, a zillion years. Like I do really sharp and savvy. And she's also going to be one of the coaches on this special offer program. And so stay tuned for that. That's going to come with the PDF of the slides and with a, uh, a downloadable version uh, of this recording. Um, and uh, that way I can help you pass today to actually get to work um, on either retooling an existing value prop, creating a new one, um, looking at what direction do I need to go in? Should I have, how many value props should I have? Those kinds of things. And that, my, my friends, is what I have for you today. I really want to thank you so much um, and uh, for attending today. Um, always a great time when everybody hangs in from the beginning, so that's really great. I thank you for that. I wish you um, luck going forward. Feel free to reach out to me via email or on Twitter at, at Knowledgence. Um, I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. I absolutely love it. Hope everyone has a terrific day. Thank you and goodbye.